So it's cost index, which is the ratio of cost of time and cost of fuel. So we kind of kind of figured out how uh, to, to compare these two parameters and we come up with speeds that is more like uh, more economical, the econ speed for aircrafts. So we have also explained the kind of so the kind of graph that we have uh, plotted here between the total operating cost with, between the time cost and the fuel cost given the total operating cost. Now, when we talk about cost index, there is something particularly which I want to re-emphasize. Uh, let's go back to a bit of basics um, coming out of performance a bit, but we'll get back to it. So what we are going to talk about here is more to do with uh, a climb. So just imagine that the aircraft is kind of climbing up all the way. Uh, so if I kind of put that here. All right. So we assume a climb of the aircraft, say for example, from sea level. And the aircraft is climbing all the way to its so-called cruising altitude cleared by the air traffic control. So the aircraft is on a climb. So generally, uh, we know that the aircraft climbs at a constant indicated airspeed, right? So we are looking at a constant indicated airspeed. And we have also learned earlier that uh, when you climb at a constant indicated airspeed, since the air density is continuously reducing, uh, we have the task keeps on increasing, right? So an increase in task can only maintain a constant indicated uh, airspeed, all right? So say for example, if I am say, take a normal aircraft climbing at say 100 knots, or say 80 knots, right? At kind of sea level under the testing conditions or the ISA conditions, it's the true airspeed is gonna be same as the indicated airspeed, correct? And that's probably 100 knots, right? So at sea level under ISA conditions, we can say that your indicated airspeed is equal to true airspeed and that's gonna be 100 knots, all right? But as we climb, the density is gonna reduce progressively, and as the air density indicators raw reduces, we need more air uh, to actually be blowing over our wing to keep the mass flow constant, right? An attempt to which the true airspeed has to increase. So once the true airspeed increases, you know, dynamic pressure, which is, which is kind of, uh, just for your information, it is half rho V squared, where this V is nothing but the true airspeed. So once you kind of increase the true airspeed, the dynamic pressure kind of increases and that is going to expand the capsule and you're going to, going to get an indicated airspeed, which is more or less constant, right? So we can see the true airspeed is going to eventually increase, right? So let me increase the true airspeed to say 110 knots. Now, as the aircraft keeps climbing with a constant indicated airspeed, the true airspeed keeps on increasing. This is something which we have already seen earlier. You climb at a constant indicator airspeed, the true airspeed has to be increased to actually maintain the mass flow. And that kind of uh, gives you a constant indicated airspeed as well, right? Perfect. Now having this particular idea in mind, think about it. When you're climbing at constant indicator airspeed, your true airspeed is increasing now. Uh, there is always a limit that, uh, particularly an airline, uh, keeps on an aircraft. Uh, which kind of prevents the aircraft from being overstressed because of excessive speeds. Now, high amount of kinetic energy, just like you trying to put your hand out of, out of an aircraft, which is impossible, but if you kind of put it, do it out of a bigger aircraft, you probably have things missing. That's because of the excess of uh, dynamic pressure because of the moving air molecules. And that kind of stresses the airframe, just like it stresses your hand when you put it outside even a high speed moving train or a car. And therefore, the, the loads, the stress loads on an aircraft is kind of expressed as a limiting indicated airspeed, which is what we call as the, uh, the operating, maximum operating indicated airspeed, or the limiting indicated airspeed, and that is represented as VMO. This is something which we have already discussed earlier numerous times whenever we have discussed about a constant indicator airspeed climb. All right, so uh, once you hit your VMO, uh, that's that's kind of the upper stress limit, which means you're not really supposed to cross that. Say, for example, if the VMO for an aircraft is, say, say 250 knot, it's just a normal regular value I'm just trying to put up, which means you cannot actually cross this value while you climb. All right. Now, the story does not really end there. And that is the focus of this particular session today, basically, because recently uh, we have come across uh, questions um, of a kind of asking about this uh, climbing with constant indicated airspeed and kind of a change over altitude uh, for the exams, both for your descriptive as well as for your multiple choice questions. And even I have a lot of uh, students coming up for their uh, CPL exams as well, where they kind of get objective 
uh, questions based on this. So let's see that in a bit more detail. So we're not really focused about the lower part of the session. This is kind of the lower part of the climb. Now uh, we are climbing at constant indicated air speed, well and good, and therefore the task is kind of increasing. And how far it can increase? It can increase up to uh, up to the VMO, which is the which is the maximum operating indicator air speed or you can say maximum limiting indicator air speed now i'm not kind of exp uh, explaining a lot more on this because we have done this multiple times let me look uh, let's look into the uh, the the higher part of the climb now now we know that we are climbing at a constant indicated air speed and for that reason your task is kind of increasing continuously all right now think about this when you when you climb at a at an increasing task there's something else that is happening parallelly right what about the speed of sound so we know the speed of sound is kind of proportional to the uh, the temperature the outside temperature and to put that up into an equation we know that speed of sound which i would write as ss is uh, 38.95 square root of temperature and remember temperature is in kelvin which means if you have temperature given in degrees celsius you kind of have to add 273 to it to kind of get the temperature in kelvin Right now, this tells us that with increasing altitude, the speed of sound is going to reduce. Why? Because as you go up, the temperature starts dropping. You know, adiabatic expansion, all those things are something which you can derive from your meteorology. Right. So as we go up, the temperature is going to drop. And since the temperature is going to drop with altitude, I'm a very slow writer. I might take some time, so pardon with me. So as, as with, with altitude, temperature is going to reduce and therefore the speed of sound is going to reduce therefore when you when you talk about speed of sound uh, the level or the altitude which you are is quite kind of um, the altitude where you are is kind of uh, significant and therefore we don't have a particular speed of sound as such so we even say we have 616 knots at sea level isa all those things is correct but when you actually change your altitude and since the temperature is uh, equally changing uh, the local but the speed of sound is going to change and therefore we come up with this term called as this local speed of sound which we represent as lss because it is kind of confined to the local height where you are on so as you climb at a constant indicated air speed not just that your true air speed is increasing but your local speed of sound is also reducing so with height the local speed of sound reduces now what we have here is an increasing task to keep the indicator air speed constant and you have a reducing local speed of sound now you know where we are going right so we have something that is connecting this true air speed with the local speed of sound and that parameter is definitely mach number so mach number is the ratio between true air speed and local speed of sound perfect we have kind of toned mach number apart and we have seen into every nook and corner of it when we discussed about mach meter uh, which is there part of your uh, engineering syllabus as well as so perfectly so mach number is task divided by local speed of sound and you can see here pretty clear that when you climb at a constant indicated air speed your task is increasing not just that your local speed of sound is also reducing you know exactly what this, this is, going, is going to do to your mach number you have a fraction with increasing numerator and decreasing denominator and that is kind of going to increase your mach number much more than task. Now, do you remember we actually studied a graph on Mach number? Let me just take a new page. I'm not sure how far you remember this in the first uh, semester of your of your course. So, if I kind of draw a graph between your altitude and your speed. So, when we talk about speed, you're talking about indicated calibrated air speeds, Mach number, uh, and uh, your true air speeds. Now, we are climbing at what constant indicated air speed, right? So, let me make that constant indicated air speed right here it is not going to change with altitude because we want it to be constant and you can see in some of the textbooks you can see calibrated air speed instead of indicator air speed now that is pretty much because the connecting factor which is the instrument error and the pressure position error are kind of made minimal these days and obviously we know we don't have a correction for maneuvering here in the user so keeping the indicator air speed constant throughout the climb we know what happens to a TAS right so TAS is going to increase with height Perfect. Now, with an increasing task and with a decreasing local speed of sound, your Mach number, remember, is increasing not just because of the increase in task. It is also because of the decrease in local speed of sound. It's kind of a double effect, right? It's, it's kind of double effect. Therefore, the Mach number is going to go shoot up just, just like anything. So if I draw the Mach number straight here, 
it's going to increase just like TAS, but at a greater rate. Perfect. Right, so having this particular information, uh, you can see how the Mach number increases. It is increasing just like TAS, but it's increasing at a greater rate uh, if you are climbing at a constant indicator airspeed. Why? Constant indicator airspeed climb will increase your TAS and with increase in altitude, your local speed of sound is going to reduce and that's going to shoot up your Mach number. Now, we know where we're getting, right? Increasing the Mach number without proper monitor is not really going to help us. Right. We have this Mach 1 that's kind of scaring us, especially for aircrafts which are not meant to fly at those, uh, at those speeds. All right. Let's come back to the diagram uh, which we have drawn earlier and let's analyze the same information here. So you can see an increasing Mach number with, uh, with altitude. Where's the pilot looking? And me as a pilot is going to kind of focus on airspeed indicator because I want to maintain this constant indicator airspeed. I don't want it to cross uh, the the VMO which is the uh, maximum limiting indicator airspeed or neither one that drop as well perfect as I do it if I don't really look at the Mac meter I am not looking at an instrument where the reading is kind of increasing progressively with altitude as I struggle to maintain this constant indicator airspeed therefore when you reach a particular altitude so let me just draw that straight here when you reach a particular altitude which we uh, call as the crossover or change over altitude. Now, this is the focus of this particular segment which we're discussing right now. Uh, people are a bit confused with this. They kind of confuse this with optimum altitude where we talk about cruise climb and step climb and stuff. That's, that's different and this is different. All right. So we have this crossover altitude also called as change over altitude. And what is changing over there? What we change over there is we change over from flying or climbing at constant indicated airspeed, which we have been doing so far. You can see the indicated airspeed is maintained constant so far. So from the indicated airspeed, we change over to constant Mach number. So airlines, they have a limitation on the uh, the constant Mach, the Mach number, the, the indicated airspeed you can fly, which is what is called as a VMO. And once you cross over, uh, to constant Mach number, that is a maximum limiting Mach number, which is called as the MMO. So MMO is nothing but maximum limiting or operating Mach number. Perfect. So now the pilot changes over his attention from the airspeed indicator to the Mach meter. So I'm not really bothered about maintaining a constant indicator airspeed anymore. I'm, I'm trying to maintain a constant Mach number. Say, for example, if my airline fixes the constant Mach number to be, say, for example, 0 0.74, which means that 74, I cannot exceed my TAS uh, more than 74 percentage of the local speed of sound. This will kind of ensure that I never hit that dangerously high speed. Remember, you no, don't necessarily have to hit Mach 1. There's something called a critical Mach number where uh, the thicker part of the airfoil can, or, or the aircraft can actually hit uh, the speed of sound before the entire fuselage hits it. So that could be a problem, right? And that drag is going to instantly creep in and you, can, you could have Mach tuck. Your range is going to just kind of crash terribly and that's, that's going to upset the aircraft most probably, especially if the aircraft is not fitted or equipped to fly it at those max speeds right so when you when you climb at constant indicator airspeed be careful your true airspeed is lavishly increasing and so as your Mach number and at crossover or change your altitude you shift your attention from flying at a constant or climbing at a constant indicator airspeed uh, from the airspeed indicator to now flying at a constant Mach number uh, which is actually kind of maintained at the uh, in, in the Mach meter, all right? You must have heard about Barber's Pole and stuff. So you've discussed all those things. I'm not going into in, that in detail. So here, I want you to focus on this particular altitude called crossover or change over altitude. We want to understand that it is not same as the optimum altitude, which we discussed you, during cruise climb. That I'll do an entire different section for that as well, if you're kind of confused with it. Now, when you fly at a constant Mach number, uh, what happens if you, the, the previous figure which you have discussed we are flying at constant indicator airspeed Let's see what happens when you're flying at constant Mach number. All right, perfect So flying at constant uh, Mach number your Mach number is kind of constant. So it's going to be here and Just like before this graph is between the altitude versus the speed of the aircraft Perfect. So when you climb at a constant Mach number, let's put down the equation for Mach number here. That is true airspeed divided by 
local speed of sound. So when I'm climbing at constant Mach number, remember I'm still climbing. Therefore, the local speed of sound, it's not really bothered about the variation in TAS and Mach number and stuff. As you climb up, your temperature is going to reduce and so as your local speed of sound. Therefore, with a climb, your LSS is, to, is going to reduce uh, no matter what. What happens to your TAS? If I want to maintain a constant Mach number, now listen to this carefully. If for a constant Mach number with a reducing denominator, which is LSS, uh, and if I want to keep my Mach number constant, uh, what would happen if I don't do anything with the TAS? With the reducing uh, local speed of sound, my Mach number is going to shoot up, right? And therefore, the TAS has to reduce to kind of compensate for the, ex the, the, the increasing tendency of Mach number. Therefore, with the reduction in local speed of sound, TAS also has to be reduced if you want to maintain a constant Mach number. And that's exactly what we do. So, in a constant indicator at speed climb, you can see that the task is increasing progressively in a constant Mach number the task is going to reduce right therefore when you focus on your Mach meter trying to maintain a constant Mach number of say 0.7 for the task kind of has to be reduced uh, by reducing the power because uh, that is how the you can compensate for this reduction in local speed of sound perfect so we have two different uh, variations happening here before achieving the crossover altitude uh, generally for for example for an aircraft it could be like maybe 25500 feet or something uh, after which or above which they kind of switch the attention uh, of from asi to mach meter thereby maintaining the aircraft uh, now at constant Mach number. I hope this particular concept is clear uh, to you. This is kind of from the performance part of your semester syllabus. And uh, uh, do let me know in your chats as well uh, if you have questions. I don't really see much of questions in the chat this time, probably because those students currently are attending my uh, course right now are kind of familiar with it. But if you do have questions, let me know and I'll definitely try to get back to it. All right. We need to discuss about optimum altitude along with this. But uh, the problem is that's kind of a different uh, section. So we are kind of creeping into the performance part of your aircraft, like cruise performance, uh, climb and descent performances. So you'll usually reach there and then we'll talk about the optimal altitude. Now, having said this, let's very quickly go back to the cost index. So uh, I'll leave you guys for the moment. Uh, when you come back after the break, we'll talk about cost index because uh, there were questions um, this time as well as for your theory where uh, you were asked to kind of tell the, the valuation of cost index with changing cost as well as a fuel and uh, as well as the time cost. All right, perfect. We'll get back to that uh, in, in a moment. So if you have kind of understood this particular concept, I really need to go back and check the graph of uh, variation of uh, optimum altitude with height, which is kind of a bit different from this particular topic, uh, especially as the, as the aircraft uh, mushes forward and when the fuel kind of gets used up. Uh, we know how the optimum altitude kind of kind of goes up and the aircraft tries to stay with it, which is more like a cruise climb, right? And we also spoke about a step climb. So kind of try to find the difference between them because we are going to talk about optimum altitude of the break. So I'll see you then.